Hey. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in to our virtual town hall. I appreciate you taking the time out tonight. Um, this is um, a, our topic tonight is, is uh, the arena numbers, which we'll get into a little bit more, but essentially it is, it is the future of housing in Alhambra and, and what our plan is for, for the future. How do we incorporate um, state obligations, local needs, all the different factors that, that um, impact development in our, in our, in our city locally. Um, we are fortunate to have our housing arena consultant tonight, um, Chris Blackney, is here to give us an overview of the RENA numbers, which is the Re Regional Housing Needs Assessment and how that relates to our housing element, which is a portion of our general plan in the city. We'll discuss um, possible solutions to meet a RENA number or allocation that is, that is um, given to us by the state um, and regional bodies. And we'll make sure to leave time for questions. So if you have questions as we go forward, please put them in the Q&A. We'll also be able to, to raise, uh, use the raise hand function and uh, we'll have some ability to ask questions uh, verbally as well. If you're joining us by phone, uh, hit star nine to raise your hand when you're allowed to speak and press star six to unmute. We'll, we'll go over that again a little bit later. But for now, why don't we get right into it because we're gonna try to pack a lot into this hour. So we'll turn it over to Chris. So Chris, why don't you, uh, why don't you get us started? All right, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm Chris uh, with Echo Northwest. We've been working on this project for a number of months with the, uh, with the city of Alhambra. Gotten to know your community uh, uh, fairly well, and uh, I'm excited to be uh, presenting to you today. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're here today, you understand that there's a lot going on in the city of Alhambra um, over the last few years. Uh, back in 2019, the city went through an exhaustive process of updating it's, uh, uh, it's a full update to its general plan. And uh, currently there are three projects that are running concurrently. Um, the city is doing a hard look at the future of East Main, uh, the East Main corridor. It is also doing a comprehensive uh, a zoning code update. And uh, the project that I'm working on is the required update to the housing element of the general plan. So while the city updated its general plan in 2019, the housing element is just now, uh, a component of the general plan is just now being updated. So uh, if you're here, you've paid, you, you've paid a little bit of attention to housing and policy in the city, you might have heard this term RENA. Um, uh, well, we're going to do a little bit of, uh, of, of RENA 101 uh, to, to actually define what that is and what that means for, uh, uh, for, for housing uh, in Alhambra over the, over the next uh, eight years or so. And so RENA stands for uh, Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Uh, and so first, it's a, um, it's a process. Uh, it's a statewide process to determine housing need over an eight-year planning cycle. And different regions throughout the state are on different timelines. Um, uh, uh, some re regions have already gone through this process. Others are just kicking them off. Uh, here in Alhambra, this cycle runs from October 2021 to October 2029. So we're, uh, we're just getting ready to pop into that cycle now. Um, Arena is also a number. Uh, it's a number of, of units, of housing units, by a level of affordability that represents Alhambra's fair share of regional housing need. Um, and it's also a planning target. And so this is often confused with a requirement for production. So when you hear, you know, we have this number, uh, uh, what do we do? How is that gonna change our community? Um, it's a planning target, not a mandate for production. So it's not saying the city has to build a number of units. It's saying it has to plan to be able to build a certain number of units over the planning period. Uh, excuse me, going the wrong way. Um, and so uh, the, how does this process work? So this, this RENA allocation process. And so how do we get to this number? The, the state of California starts it off, the cycle off by determining the statewide housing need. And that number was 3.5 million units. Uh, it then goes through an allocation process by which it takes those units and it gives them to the individual metropolitan planning organizations throughout the state. Alhambra is located in the Skag region. And so Skag was allocated 1.34 million units as part of that process. 
And then SCAG goes through a exhaustive pro pro process over the course of about a year in partnership with all of its representative communities to develop a methodology on how it takes that 1.34 million units and allocates it down to the individual cities. And through that process, uh, the city of Alhambra was given a number of 6,825 housing units that it must plan for over this eight year cycle. Um, what we're showing here in this table, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a couple of things. First, we are comparing the last planning cycle, which is called Rena 5, the fifth cycle, with the sixth cycle. Uh, to, and we, when we look at these things side by side, we can observe a, a number of things. First, you can see the big jump up in number. Um, so 6825 compared to 1492, that's about a 450% increase uh, uh, in Alhambra's number uh, this cycle versus last cycle. We can also see that Rena is not just a single number. It's not just 6,825 units. It needs to be allocated across housing units that are suitable to accommodate varying levels of, of, uh, of income. Uh, and in Alhambra, 41% of that allocation is, um, is dedicated to households that earn uh, what we call lower income, which is 80% of median family income or lower. Um, here we're demonstrating that Alhambra is not really being singled out in this, and so it's not that that you know Alhambra has been given a disproportionately large share relative to other jurisdictions. This is something that's happened to almost uh, because the number at the state level is so high and the number at the regional level is so high. This is the condition that most jurisdictions in the state are are, are facing, and that's a aggressive planning target. Uh, in in Alhambra. There, your number represents 22% of, of existing households. That's about par for the course relative to other, uh, other communities in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, but, uh, but certainly it's a, it, it's a big number and a, and, and a challenge. So why is this number so high? I hear this pretty much every presentation I give. Uh, uh, we have this big number. What, why, is it, why is it significantly larger than the last cycle? And the major reason is that the state of California is getting serious about housing production in the state, and that it uh, there had, for good reason. There has been um, a, a 20 years of under chronic underproduction in housing um, uh, statewide, and it's a major problem uh, also here in the San Gabriel Valley. And so, uh, when we say that underproduction is a problem, we should, uh, that might be a mischaracterization. I would say that the symptoms of underproduction are really problematic for communities. And those symptoms really include things like cost burdening and overcrowding. And so when you, when you, see, uh, when you have underproduction, you have price increases that absent increases in income means that people have to spend a progressively larger amount of their income on housing. Uh, and so they don't have as much resources to allocate to other things. Uh, uh, and so sadly in, in, in Alhambra, one out of every three households spends more than 30% of their income um, on, on housing. It also leads to overcrowding, uh, where as a result of cost burden, um, in part, people are just cramming more people in a home. And to the extent that there's more people living in a home than there are actually rooms in that home, and in Alhambra, um, uh, one in six households are experiencing this. And, uh, both of these rates are, are actually higher than, than regional averages. So this is a bit of a problem that's more pronounced in Alhambra um, than it is at the regional, regional level. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a housing element, what it is and how it relates directly to this, this topic of, of RENA. Um, as Council Member Maloney uh, uh, led into this, this, uh, this meeting, the, the housing element is a component of the general plan. It's a required component of the general plan. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the general plan, you can generally think about it as a uh, instruction manual, um, an instruction manual that guides the, the decisions that the city makes about everything from mobility, uh, health and safety, land use, and in case of the housing element, uh, uh, decisions around housing policy and planning. But unlike other elements in the general plan, um, it's required to be updated on an eight year cycle by the state. And it's also the only element of the general plan where the state of California has the authority to review and, and certify it. So this, this component of your general plan actually gets sent to the state and they check the box to see whether or not you are compliant um, uh, with, with what you are supposed to do as part of the housing element or not. So oftentimes, um, 
housing, uh, discussions around housing uh, typically center around this topic of, yes, we want more housing in our community, or we need more housing in our community, or no, we don't want any more housing in our community, um, this dynamic. Uh, the housing element is decidedly not that. Um, as we went through in the, the arena portion of this presentation, that actual decision has been made for you um, uh, or in made in collaboration with, with state and regional leaders. So, so we have a number uh, that that decision has been made. And uh, so the housing element isn't yes or no, it's more about what, what, uh, where, what, and how. So where housing should go in the community, what types of housing is appropriate for the community and how the city can take meaningful steps to execute on, on, on that strategy. So the, the general plan generally has uh, 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 four primary components. Uh, the first is an analysis of housing need. So we do a dive into uh, to what is needed across income categories, uh, what type of housing is needed to accommodate uh, seniors or persons with disabilities. It's a highly technical analysis that's done with using, uh, uh, using data that we derive from the Census Bureau, from our community workshop uh, uh, surveys, uh, uh, and, and other sources. We also take a look at constraints in the community, constraints on housing. So we look at uh, uh, things like our market factors, like high land costs or high construction costs per prohibiting housing. Um, are, are there government regulations like uh, exhaustive design review or, uh, or permitting fees or timelines to, that, are, that are resulting in some form of constraint? Uh, and we also try to document the, the resources and opportunities that the city has to help facilitate uh, uh, housing production. We do a deep dive uh, on sites. And so part of the housing element is that you are required to come up with a parcel level inventory of sites that are suitable to accommodate housing. Um, in, in Alhambra, obviously, the, we don't have a lot of vacant land. And so it's, uh, it's mostly uh, identifying redevelopment sites. And then finally, we do a, uh, a review and revision to the city's housing policies and programs. And so we take a look at what was scripted out uh, in, the, in the instruction manual eight years ago and see what worked, what didn't, what needs to be tweaked, and then how the city can respond to new, uh, new challenges and new regulations that you are uh, being asked to, uh, uh, to address uh, at the state level. Um, and so I, I alluded to this previously, but I, I always like referencing again here, um, RENA and the housing element do not pose a mandate for building homes, but the intent of this whole process is that by having zone capacity that's proven to accommodate the amount of land of, of units that uh, your, your uh, planning target is, and by having sites with that zone capacity and by taking efforts to remove constraints, and leverage resources and promote pro-housing policies. Doing these things collectively should, uh, 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 and in good faith, should uh, result in a, in a condition where the market should be able to function and deliver housing when and, and where, where it is needed. Um, so oftentimes I also get asked the question, uh, so what if we don't want to do this? Like what happens if we say no, the mandate's too big, we don't want to do it. Um, well, the housing policy is a world of carrots and sticks, uh, and so there's a penalty for that. Uh, first, the city would be deemed to have an incomplete uh, general plan, and so it could get sued by developers, by the state itself, uh, by advocacy groups, um, and so that would just open the, the, the city up for a range of litigation. Um, it would also make the city ineligible for the carrots. Uh, so there are a bunch of new funding sources and existing funding sources the state provides to help develop programs and, and uh, for housing and otherwise. Uh, 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 and this would make uh, being non-compliant would make the city ineligible for, for those resources. And um, perhaps uh, the, one of the more significant ones is also that you have to do this again in four years instead of eight. And the unaccommodated arena effectively gets rolled over to that next cycle. So you're, you're just kicking the can down the road and saying, we're not gonna address it now, but in four years, we'll really, really, really have to address it because it's gonna be our mandate now plus what the next mandate is. And it's, um, it's gonna be even more of a change in a even less amount of time. So, that brings us where we are today. So thank you, Chris, um, that background and, and the explanation of, of where we are and, and how we got there. 
Um, before we move on to sort of the next um, set of slides here, I, I was wondering maybe you could you could describe, and I know that I've gotten this question previously, is, is um, you just talked about the sticks and carrots that the state has to encourage and, and conjole and, and threaten cities to actually meet their green and numbers. Uh, a lot of the questions that I get sometimes are, how come other cities, nearby cities that we don't necessarily have to name, how come they haven't even bothered to comply with their with their arena allocation in previous cycles, and how is it different now? Um, so I'm I'm not familiar of the cities that that you're referencing. Um, I I know that there are precedents for for jurisdictions getting sued. A few on the uh, a few on the beach uh, have have actually been sued by the state and and eventually came around and had to do their do their process. And right. so. Um, so uh, in the last, I will say in the last cycle, the uh, the sticks weren't as big as they are now, um, and so uh, they, the state has stepped up its uh, its uh, its review. It stepped up its authority to review, and it stepped up the action that it could it can take against jurisdictions. And so I would say most jurisdictions are taking it uh, 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 very seriously uh, in in this cycle, at least from my personal experience. Yeah, that that's my perspective as well. And then um, one other little small point. Uh, previously, you know, you had mentioned that this is not, and thank you for clarifying, it is not a mandate, a requirement to build new units, but it's a requirement on the city to, to plan and zone and set things up appropriately so that uh, we can build this number. But ultimately, when we do that, you, know, you sort of acknowledged it, that it becomes, it's very easy for um, anyone who wants to develop these new units to come in and get the appropriate permits and approvals to build at that point. That's the intent of this arena uh, uh, requirement. Is that? Yeah, the, the, the intent is to the extent that the city can identify. So to the extent that the city has some regulation in place that is dis, that is prohibiting housing production. And, and that's, that's been very common. I'm not saying that's an issue in Alhambra, but it's very common in, in lots of places around California. That, um, that, that it just makes it very, very difficult. It could be, like I mentioned, some, some jurisdictions have exceptionally high fees. Some jurisdictions have permitting processes that um, are, 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 are take longer than they otherwise should. And so part of this process for us is to identify if there are any of those types of constraints, things like, uh, like uh, park uh, design standards or development standards, like parking ratios and stuff that, that over time get out of whack. Uh, 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 zoning code gets out of whack over time if it's not changed. That's one of the reasons why the city is going through the process right now of doing a comprehensive code update, understanding that there are issues in the code that are, are making it more difficult for development to occur. And so the city is taking active active measures to, to address those. All right, thank you. So uh, we're on this slide, Housing, how can we meet uh, our mandate. So obviously you referenced this too, Hein, we're somewhat of a built out city. It's not like we have a lot of open space to, to, um, to, to get into. So where are these, where are these housing units gonna go? Uh, they have to go somewhere. Um, and I think we are, are we, at, are we gonna do a, a poll or something at this point? Um, so I'm gonna set up a little context first and then we'll have, we'll have Scott kick off the poll. So, um, so I think it's useful when we, before we start to talk about solutions to frame the magnitude of, of what we're talking about. And so uh, as we've gone through this process, um, we've identified what we think is kind of existing capacity versus like what we think needs to happen through some form of program and policy change. And so I, I, I mentioned it briefly, but it's just worth saying again, this is a much, much, much easier process for a community on the periphery that can say, okay, well, there's our 100 acres of vacant land. Let's make sure it's zoned right. All good. You don't have vacant land. You have 40 units of capacity of vacant land in the city of Alhambra. So most, if not all, of this shortfall needs to be met through uh, uh, the, the repurposing and reutilization of existing property within, within the community. Um, it's super challenging. And so uh, what we've identified is, uh, is a shortfall uh, when we take a look at the various levels of, of, of uh, underutilization uh, under existing zoning conditions, uh, we find a shortfall of about 3,000 to 4,000 units. And if I was going to put that into perspective, uh, at the city's current uh, high density zoning uh, level, that would be equate to an area about the size of Alhambra's golf course if it was all put in, in one area. So it's not an insignificant surface area to be thinking about. And so 
Um, <clears throat> so when we start to think about, okay, we have this 3,000 to 4,000 unit shortfall, what are some things just at a topical level, at the 10,000 level, you know, broad categories that the city can start to look at and, and how to, to address this need through, uh, through some sort of policy and program change or zoning change? Um, and the first, and I just kind of go through this, through this progressively, the first is looking at subtle densification and low density residential areas through accessory dwelling units. This is a strategy that has been highly uh, uh, successful in many parts of, of, of the country. Um, uh, uh, so what this is, is if you're not familiar with an ADU, you could think about it as a guest house or a garage conversion. So, uh, uh, so you could put an additional unit attached to your home or detached from your home. Um, they are allowed by state law. Um, so it's not the city is now thinking about allowing them. This is what the city can do to help promote, um, uh, uh, ADU, uh, uh production. Another strategy would be looking at upzoning in low existing low and medium density areas. So these would be single family or medium density neighborhoods where you would uh, look at allowing more units. So uh, in terms of a step up in scale, you'd think of you know seeing duplexes on corner lots, or you would see maybe a cottage cluster in an R two zone, something like that. Um, Another strategy is to think about encouraging higher density development in concentrated areas. And so here you're basically instead of spreading it thin, you're thinking about more spikes because you're putting the same amount of capacity in a, in a, in a fixed amount in a more fixed amount of space. And so you would see uh, you likely see you have to have to see taller buildings and more density, more massing in, um, in these types of places. Uh, similarly, encouraging higher density development, um, uh, both in downtown or along existing commercial corridors. So these are areas that currently utilize uh, transit. These are areas that currently uh, have opportunities for mixed use, have, uh, have existing employment. Um, you would also look at upzoning um, high density residential areas. And so these are areas in the community that have already been identified as being suitable for higher density development. This would look at, um, at looking at strategies to add housing capacity within these areas. And so you would allow effectively more units per acre in, uh, in some of these areas to try to help facilitate uh, 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 redevelopment. And then finally, um, an option would be to look at allowing housing um, where it's not currently allowed today. So this would be um, just for context, some of the areas that we've identified where housing's not currently allowed is the Eastman Corridor, uh, large portions of the Garfield Corridor, um, uh, uh, most of Valley Boulevard. Um, and then there are some areas of uh, where there's existing industrial co uh, concentrations where there are some pockets where housing could, uh, could be uh, suitable to, uh, to take a look at as an alternative. So Jeff, that ends my slideshow. That sets up um, uh, the, the, the context. Um, uh, and so I believe uh, we, we, we have a poll um, that, that we're gonna put forth and I, I can pause and let, let us get that going logistically. Sure, thank you. So, um... We could take a few minutes, everyone, to read through these questions and um, submit your your responses here. Uh, this is helpful just to kind of get feedback. This is not, you know, it's not. We understand it's not scientifically uh, valid polling or anything like that, but it just helps to get kind of a snapshot of what attendees to these town halls are thinking. So you could go through these and and um, submit your your responses. If anyone's listening on the phone, I can go ahead and, and read some of these questions um, out loud. So I don't think you can participate on the phone, but at least you can hear what we're talking about. Um, do you believe the city should take more aggressive approach to marketing ADUs? Those are the accessory dwelling units, the granny flats or mother-in-law units, um, citywide and develop programs to encourage construction of ADUs in single family and other residential zones. So. Basically, do you want more ADUs or, or not? Should we be promoting those or not? Do you think the city should explore changes in zoning to add density to existing areas that are medium and high density residential uses? Think of, think of sort of the um, you know, mixed use areas along Main Street and other parts of town and some of the, the smaller apartment buildings, you know, the, the 
six, eight, nine, you know, 10, 12 uh, realm for medium density. Um, and then the third question that's on the screen is for this question, please post your response in the Q&A. If the city had to consider adding housing in zones where it's currently not allowed, which areas should the city consider exploring? And then for this third question, yeah, please enter your responses in the chat. Um, uh, we, uh, this polling mechanism doesn't allow a kind of a, a, a pop-up box. And so if you have, um, if you have some, some thoughts, as I mentioned, I kind of threw out some of the areas that already don't allow housing, but um, I'm, I've been trying to encourage folks, if there's a site that you, that you have in mind or you, you, know, you have some idea where, where you think uh, a, a good spot would be, um, uh, please enter it in the chat. Um, so there's a Q&A box uh, and you could write in um, any, anything that you want uh, in that section. We will grab those responses and ensure that they are, uh, they are recorded. So someone posted that there's no option to submit an answer for the third question. Just go ahead and type it right, just as you did in that Q and A. And this is sort of a, uh, this is the the essay question answer portion. Not uh, you can't really answer that in the yes or no option. Okay, so I don't know how many more folks we uh, want to have answer the question. Let's wait a couple more minutes just for, for everyone to get a chance. Um, yeah, we've generally been going about four minutes or so. Um, and so we're about three now, so maybe just give it another minute. Thank you. And just a reminder, if, you, um, if you've been listening and you, uh, you do would like you would like to make a comment or ask a question um, verbally. You're welcome to raise your hand, and we'll start putting people in line for that. Um, and then we can get into a, a, a Q and A session. If you have any anything you'd like to say, we, we'd love to hear hear your questions and um, and feedback. So it, it looks like we, um, we're, we're uh, about topped out on the poll questions. Um, yeah. um, so, but just as a reminder, if, you, if something pops into your head the rest of the way and you wanna enter it into the, into the Q&A um, for question three, go ahead and do that. But I think we could probably close, close the polls, Scott. Um, okay, so let's go ahead. We'll go ahead and do that. Oh, there we go. We share. Um, we'll go, look. there we go. We have, um, This is called low voter participation. <laughs> Got to get more, more, um, <laughs> more people to the polls, but it, it's still helpful to see. So, on the first question, obviously, you have um, eighty percent of the folks um, thinking that we should we should be promoting ADUs. Um, second question, it's sort of split between you know should we be also looking at the existing high and medium density residential areas? <clears throat> and then in the Q and A, I don't know. Can everyone see the Q and A? Um, we have answers that East Valley Boulevard, uh, formal industrial areas by Valley and along East Main, but keep mixed use to allow office and retail to be mixed in. Um, <laughs> the answer is everywhere in Alhambra, okay? Um, and, and downtown or where it's currently not allowed. These are, thank you for the answers, we appreciate that. And hopefully um, whoever was EF that typed a question, and if you wanna type a question for your response into the Q&A, please feel free to do that. Um, so, this is, um, it's, it's helpful to get all this feedback. It's really interesting to hear this and to see the slide that, that Chris and his team put together. Um, so if there, are, if there are specific questions now, please go ahead and either raise your hand. Um, I did not have my thing up. So if you have specific questions, please go ahead and put them into the, into the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can ask it live. Um, I, I happen to have just maybe a couple of, of prompts maybe for Chris to just, just talk about. So, um, you know, one of, one of the things that is important to me and that I, I run on and, and is something that I do in my um, professional career is, you know, focus on sustainability, environmental sustainability, the sustainability of a community like Alhambra. Um, I, I'd like to know from that perspective, you know, of the different options that were provided, 
what in your experience has shown to be the most responsible type of development, um, where to focus development from a sustainability perspective? Um, sure. So as we've kind of already teed up, um, Alhambra is landlocked. And so for me, that makes the efficient use of land like topic number one, that's the most important thing is using land efficiently. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that came up in our community workshop that we did a few months ago um, was that in Alhambra, only 8% of residents uh, live and work in the community. So most people that work in Alhambra can't, uh, can't find a home suitable for their, for their, their reasons. Uh, in the community and vice versa for folks that live here are finding jobs. And so that jobs housing balance is inequitably unsustainable. Um, and so uh, providing, so one strategy is providing a more diverse range of housing types uh, that can accommodate a broader, a broader set of needs. And that could be through missing middle, that could be through, uh, uh, so missing middle is effectively this, this seg segment of housing that's, uh, that's more affordable. It's, uh, uh, you know, things like ADUs, cottages, townhomes, those types of things that are that uh, can provide greater access to uh, uh, to to homes from an affordability level, um, but ultimately, when you're thinking about it from a purely sustainability perspective, um, you know, more housing in proximity to jobs, more housing in proximity to transit, um, and uh, uh, and using the least amount of of land and prox and utilizing um, proximity to existing infrastructure. So I think these things collectively, uh, you know, you, you may have heard the term transit oriented development before. Those things are inherently uh, uh, types of development forms that have the uh, the lowest, if you will, like resource quotient per uh, per per household. So same, same type of question, but from a different perspective, because I know that one of the um, one of the things that just is a constant issue, constant problem, uh, frankly, in Alhambra is the the volume and the amount of traffic, just vehicle traffic that we have here. You know, we're, how we're situated at the, you know, we have freeways going through town. We have a, a freeway stub that dumps off into into our city. Um, we are uh, very much, you know, we live up to our <laughs> Our motto as a gateway. A lot of people pass through Alhambra, um, including people that live here. So, from a traffic perspective, and I'll, I'll maybe I don't want to frame the question too much, but I've, I've always thought that the the that really the only way and the most effective way to reduce traffic, at least on our, our local streets, is to is to encourage people to get out of their cars to not drive everywhere every time they have to go somewhere. So, from that from that angle. Um, I don't want to lead you too far down the road, but what I mean, what do you do about that? How how would how would you look at it from your professional experience? How would you look at recommending a certain type of development and finding gaps in our housing needs? What what would we do there? Is it spread out through the city? Is it density? Is it the you know the the upzoning the R two and R three neighborhoods? What would you what would you say to that? Sure. Um, so. Uh... If I was a transportation engineer, I could answer the first part of your question, but I'm not. So I don't know really what you can do about being in between jobs and housing clusters. Um, no, yeah. I'm not asking. I'm not asking you to answer that. That's uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, that, that's certainly a difficult position to be in. Um, uh, I, I kind of brought it up already. Like improving your jobs housing balance is super important. I mean, the fact that 91% of people in the community are are getting in a car or excuse me are taking some form of leaving or going in, uh, between the community um, uh, every single day. Uh, that's, that's a big issue. So, so the more people that you can, you have in kind of whole communities. So uh, having the nexus of housing jobs and, and, uh, and recreation and, and entertainment in close proximity to each other um, that reduces trips. Um, and that allows you to have, uh, uh, have fewer vehicle miles travel. It allows folks to, uh, to access transit to get to for longer trips. Um, it allows projects to become more feasible because you can park them at lower parking ratios. And so that gets fewer cars on the road because there's fewer, fewer, uh, uh, there's less of a need for it. So those are, those are some of the things I would say to, to uh, answer your question. Um, we do have a question in the chat box from uh, Lewis McCammon. So question for Chris, when will the draft you produce be available for public review? Um, Chris, I'm sure you can see that question. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, and yeah I can answer that, Lewis. So um, we'll keep we'll keep everybody up to date on that. The original timeline, yeah, has slipped, obviously, because of COVID. And um, so 
we are are targeting trying to get um, the city a its administrative draft, which is its internal draft, uh, uh, to re to review before uh, we make the the draft public. I would say we're probably still a few months away from the public review draft, so I would look to June at this point. Once we get a firmer number, um, uh, we'll be able to put after we get an administrative draft to the city then we'll be able to have a, a, you know, kind of a target that we'll put on the website and get that um, distributed uh, uh, out to the folks that have signed up for updates. But, um, but the document itself, when it's available, will be in all likelihood posted on the city's website to which we will link to um, uh, uh, via the, the housing element website, I believe, so. Um, thank you for that. Um, so, <laughs> We sort of touched on this and tell me if you can't answer it, but you know, um, from my, being a member of the city council, it feels to some extent like, um, you know, if there's any Star Wars fans out there, you know, when they're in that um, garbage disposal area and the walls are sort of, you know, coming in and they can't figure out a way to do it. It does feel like from a local level um, that our discretion in a lot of these housing areas is just shrinking. Every year, there are new bills coming down the line from the legislature that to take away a little bit more and more and more of our discretion to actually have a say in what kinds of development and how we develop on cities, at least for housing needs. Can you describe that trend? Is that something up, up your alley that you can at least speak to for a little bit? Um, I, I'll keep it topical. I'd say that it um, that's not going to change. It's not likely to change um, anytime soon. And I would say uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't put Alhambra in this box, but there are good reasons why that's happening. Um, and uh, uh, so the ex the move toward more uh, objective standards uh, and things is not it's a trend that's happening at the state level. It's happening at the national level, um, and uh, I think it's going to uh, to continue in California. Um, and so communities are going to have to to adjust. Uh, their processes to respond to to uh, new legislation at the state. So describe what uh, an objective standard is versus a subjective standard in that context. Sure. So I'm not a planner, but I would say that that the uh, from from a review perspective, the uh, the the city um, is not allowed to disapprove a uh, a project based on a, a standard that is not clearly defined. So you, you effectively have to say, okay, any project that meets these clearly defined standards should be approved. And if it's, it, you're, you're not allowed to say, oh, well, we don't like the way that that is. Uh, we're not gonna approve it or we're gonna put it through a process uh, uh, because we just don't, don't like the way it looks. If it meets it's, it's, um, the, 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 the standards that have been laid forth, then it's supposed to be approved. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, you know, obviously that can be frustrating for members of the community and, you know, council members who are, who are trying to uh, plan their cities out appropriately in the way they see fit, but without those, without those clear objective standards to compare a project against their, you know, to some extent, I've heard a lot of frustration that people feel like their hands are tied. There's nothing to do about it, but, um, you know, I, I think we have to Find, if I'm going to pontificate a little bit, you know, it's up to us and in, in our community and, and members of the community to help um, the elected officials try to figure out the best way forward for Alhambra. Do this in a way that that fits our community, that meets our community. That's why things like tonight are so important. And we'll talk a little bit later, I think, about how people can can be more involved in this process. But we did have a new question come up um, from an anonymous attendee. So, with the outflow from California in recent years, and due to the pandemic, we've been hearing about. Uh, is there any chance these numbers might be revised downward? Zero, <laughs> zero chance. Uh, um, so the, uh, the there was uh, several appeals processes um, as a part of this effort. So when the original number um, that came to Skag from the from the state, where the one point three million number came down, um, Skag alongside all of its jurisdictions, I shouldn't say all, but most of the jurisdictions appealed that that number and said, hey, this is this is three three X what it was before. What's going on here? Um, that number was not moved uh, through that appeal process uh, uh, in a meaningful way. And so then they proceeded on with the allocation. Now, once the allocation was made to the individual jurisdictions, there was yet another appeals process where every individual jurisdiction had the opportunity to appeal to SCAG and say, hey, you gave us too much of our, more than our fair share of, our, of, of this number. We want to appeal our number. 
um, Alhambra did that. Alhambra did appeal to SCAG formally, and um, its appeal was ultimately denied. And we're at the point now where it's final, final. Um, we can take this number as, as, as canon at this point, and that's where we have to, uh, to design our strategies around at this point. Yeah, and I, that's right. And I think we, we thought we had some, some good arguments as to why our number was, was too high for our community. Um, but I think it ended up going up from there <laughs> because other so, cities. Yeah, sadly, uh, there were, uh, I think, two jurisdictions out of the 50 plus that appealed that had a meaningfully successful appeal uh, where uh, some number was, uh, was, uh, was approved. The methodology then took whatever that was appealed and just gave it to everybody. And so I think your our number went up by 17 units or 15 units or something of that magnitude. And if I recall, one of the cities that was successful, I don't know, was it Pico Rivera or something, um, was able to, to show um, SCAG that, hey, you, you told us to build housing in an area that's essentially a floodplain that's subject to a flood control easement. So it was, it was legally impossible to, to zone it for that. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's that's the sort of thing. Um, but we did, you know, we 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 heard some of the frustration from the community members, and um, I think the council also felt like it was it was initially too high of an allocation, and, and our what we got for that was a higher number. <laughs> so, um, and I, I I asked the same question as um, as the the question that was just typed, you know, because you know we don't know. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years. You know, obviously we're conducting this meeting by Zoom, which just uh, a year and a half ago wouldn't, you know, it would have been sort of, you know, possible technologically, but just not really feasible for most people because they don't have it. And I think we are going into a different time and maybe those trends will change about housing needs. You do hear people moving from big cities to, to smaller towns and they just, uh, maybe they go in once a month and participate virtually, but you, you, you still don't think there's any chance, at least in this cycle, that it's going to reflect any of those changes. Yeah, I, I, I would put the odds, I mean, I, you never like to say zero. I'm sorry for saying zero, but I would put it at exceptionally low. You uh, said zero, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we went over what the city could do about our arena numbers. Um, um, you know, this, this the, the allocation is just a numbers thing. So we can still control some of the things like the design aspect um, um, and and sort of the peripheral issues around the units. Is that correct, or am I am I off base there? I'm sorry, I missed I missed you broke up for me a minute, minute there. Um, can you repeat the back half of that question, please? Sure. The the I'm just asking about the arena numbers. They're just it's just a numerical allocation, and it doesn't get into anything qualitative about you know what the what the units will look like or where you have to put it or design features or anything like that is that is that correct um so design no so the so effectively we have to take a look at you know uh, where, where design and features and standards come in is to the extent that that the city's policies around those are keeping development from happening so say the character and nature of sites in alhambra are a certain way that don't align with the existing standards we call that out and say hey we need to make some changes to our standards because development can't happen based on the character and nature of of um of, of land uh, in in um in alhambra so that's that's where that would come into place in terms of location um i'm glad you brought that up because it's one of the most important things that we're taking a look at in this cycle and that's affirmatively furthering fair housing so historically, you would see jurisdictions try to, uh, I shouldn't say try, that would imply some intent. Um, they, would, they would be, the trend would be to allocate lower income housing in specific areas of, of town. And oftentimes these were areas uh, that were, uh, had low access to opportunity. Um, and there are historical reasons for that. Uh, and there are contemporary reasons for that, but the, we, under existing law, we need to take a look at that. We need to ensure that, that the city, when it's looking at where it's allocating sites that are appropriate for lower income uh, uh, housing unit production are in areas that have access to opportunity. Um, let's, let's go to one of the questions that came up and then I do wanna circle back to, to that issue of um, low income housing that you brought up. I think there's some, there's some um, substance there. So Calame Fam, uh, hi Calame, thanks for joining. Um, can you explain more about how the units are counted and do we determine that a max can exist in the area and count that way? And then she's got the second part you can see there too, Chris. Okay, so um, to answer this question, sure. 
So assume, I'll just take an example. Okay, say, assume there's a one acre prop piece of property that we say this, this site is suitable for, for housing. Um, the way we make our calculation is we take a look at the existing zoning on that, that, uh, that piece of property, and this just pick a round number, 30 units per acre. So that acre would be uh, theoretically allowed to accommodate up to 30 units. Then we make a, a, we use a, an analysis to say, okay, well, what is, what is the development trend in, in Alhambra? We take a look at the existing projects and we, we, we factor that down a bit to, to accommodate for the fact that not all housing gets developed to 100% of maximum density capacity. And so, uh, so we apply a factor to that. And so we might assume that, you know, the development trend in Alhambra is 90% of maximum capacity. And so that would take that number, that, uh, that uh, uh, 30 units number on a site and take it down to 27 units on the site because it's not developing out to max. So the second part of the, this question, um, so this is not a need to approve production. Um, and so this is not, uh, uh, so there, you know, this is not approving development of sites, it's approving planning. Um, so the city, any change in zoning that the city needs to make to increase capacity. So say we need to go out and find, you know, a hundred acres of land that we need to rezone to accommodate this capacity. Again, just picking a round number for simplicity and discussion purposes. Um, that needs to be done within a certain period of time. And I believe it's three years uh, in, within the planning cycle. I would expect it to happen sooner because the city is already going through its comprehensive zoning code update. So while I can't commit to the city's timeline on that, because that process has already begun, we would expect it to happen fairly early in the planning cycle. And then uh, for that eight-year cycle, what, I mean, what we have to do at the beginning of that cycle is have our housing element approved by um, the state, correct? Yeah, so you have to have the plan housing element approved by the state, which recommends that these changes need to be made, and then you have three years to, to effectively make those changes. Again, it's going to happen sooner than that. But one important extension of this question um, that's not explicitly asked, but I think it's important to bring up, is that you need to maintain your inventory through the planning cycle by, um, by affordability level. And so to use another uh, example, say those 30 units that, um, that we were planning for, for capacity, let's say that, that that's, um, that's we, we say that that's a low income property. So that's a property that's suitable to accommodate lower income. But in the real world, uh, a developer comes along and purchases that property and builds market rate housing. Um, now you have a 30 unit deficiency in your arena. Um, and so you have to accommodate for that on another site. And so the strategy is typically for, especially for lower income arena to over, to over, uh, uh, plan for it. And so even though our number for, for lower income might be, you know, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, maybe it's 2,500 units or 2,700 units. We probably should plan for a little bit more than that because we don't want to end up in a situation where, sites identified for lower income get get taken down for non-low income and then now the city has to go through this continual constant process of trying to identify additional capacity. yeah yeah um and th there's one more question that typed in i think it's a good one but before we get to that one can you talk more about the affordable housing component of this number that we're looking at in front of us um, and so, yeah, so basically, uh, as a summary, you, they, the, the, the units of RENA are allocated to these different income levels and to, to allocate RENA to a lower income level, how sites have to meet a number of criteria. Um, so they have to be of a certain size. They have to be um, of a certain density. And that's because the economics of developing affordable housing are infinitely harder than, than developing regular housing. And so uh, sites that meet those criteria um, uh, are only allowed to, and I, like I mentioned before, distribution and access to opportunity. Um, so though that, that's how, uh, how income or arena generally relates to, uh, to, uh, to affordable housing and income. Okay. Um, and, and Lou, Lou McCammon typed a question, but first we'll get to the one that's been there for a minute. Um, what are the specific sticks slash penalties slash money that can be withdrawn from the city if we don't comply? Um, this, is a, this is a big question. I don't know if I had time to cover it all, but um, so I mentioned a couple of them. It would, uh, in terms of penalties, it would be, um, 
it would be obviously open for litigation. Um, you would be uh, uh, going back to that, that that reference. You would um, you would be having to do this process over and over again. In terms of money, like uh, the city was just awarded a a, a grant for um, a, 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 by the state a local early action planning grant. I think it was somewhere three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars to to uh, take a look at housing policies that would go away. Um, there's permanent um, funds that are in place, permanent local housing fund, other funds that are in place to help promote housing um, and, and uh, other programs, those would go away. We can pull together a list and post it somewhere maybe that, that, that takes a look at all of the funding sources, but I admittedly don't know them all off the top of my head. So I don't even know what, what sources the city um, has access to uh, in, in, uh, in completely now. So. Yeah, I mean, we're making a big push towards um utilizing as, as much state uh, grant funding as possible. And I've heard that that is one thing that, that the state is definitely looking at is, is suspending any grants to cities for, for unrelated purposes, right? For, for streets, for parks, for water projects, for all sorts of things that, we, that we're really um, counting on those funds for. So, Well, and if, if you're following President Biden's housing legislation, I mean, this is something that's, that's making its way up into the federal level. Um, so, I mean, they're taking a look at tying, you know, access to to grant funding for infrastructure to housing production targets for affordable housing production targets. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, my takeaway from all this is that it's it's real. Um, if it didn't have teeth before, it's got some teeth now, um, one way or another. So, uh, Lou, Lou said, uh, Chris, that you mentioned the land here at the golf course uh, could be devoted to, to housing and could close the gap um, during this six cycle. Um, there are other golf courses in the area, it's true. And he's asking what steps can be taken to consider the use of all or part of the golf course for housing and additional park space. I definitely agree with you on that one, Lou. Um, and if so, you know, maintain the trees and, um, and then he has a comment about the um, low income that I think you did touch on just, uh, just a minute ago. Um, we are, and also mentioned the fact that the city is undertaking to, um, low-income housing projects on its own sort of surplus land in the downtown Main Street area. So thank you for pointing that out, Lou. I, I Chris, I know you can't answer about our own golf course, but I, so I'll, I'll mention that a little bit. But, um, you know, we did a couple of years ago, you know, historically the golf course was nine holes and then we expanded it to 18. I think when golf was in its heyday and it was a very popular sport and, and the yeah, Humber golf course became a very popular uh, place. Uh, golf has obviously waned for, for many reasons, um, and it's not as popular a sport as it used to be. The driving range, I think, is the big driver of uh, action over there now. Um, so I think we have to keep that on, on our radar. I don't know personally if, if it's uh, the timing works out for this current cycle and the current arena, uh, ha uh, the housing element that we're doing, only because we are under contract. We do have a, con a new contract with a new golf course operator. And I've said when this has come up in the past that we we really need to be monitoring the performance of the golf course, the demand for that full 18 holes there, um, because I think there there are other uses that are really in demand in the city, um, you know, including housing, but especially park space, given its location at, in, in Almanzar Park. Uh, I think we have to keep that on the radar screen, and and I am not going to let that that. Um, that fade from our from our attention, um, and I want to make sure we're paying attention. I, I also think we ought to give a you know good faith fair a, t a fair shot for the current operator to to bring in more business and do a good job there. But um, that is absolutely on the table. I mean, I know that's that's an important issue to you, so we can talk about that. Um, so Eric has a question. Um, a planning commissioner here, our planning commissioner Garcia has a, has a comment here. So at a recent planning commission. For a nine unit development, the applicant opted for the in lieu fee instead of providing an affordable housing unit. The amount of the in lieu fee was about $100,000. The IHO clearly missed the mark here for making affordable housing available. The city should consider amending the recently passed IHO to increase its ability to actually create affordable housing stock. Uh, I, I, I want to hear more about that, Eric. Let's talk about that um, maybe offline. I, I, I don't recall specifically the formula, but it certainly wasn't intended to allow uh, new housing developers to, to get off scot-free or at least you know for, for less than it would cost to build a unit. That's obviously uh, not sufficient there um, to build a, a unit, at least a freestanding unit offsite. So, so it's definitely worth 
worth looking into. The good thing about housing, uh, any ordinance is that it can be amended um, with experience. We can go back and, and tweak it. So let's talk about that um, offline, but thanks for that. Yeah, and I would, I would say that I, I, would, I would just add on there that the city um, in lieu fees are, um, are a, uh, a I th I, in my opinion, an important component of, of an IHO ordinance. I think you need to give development an opportunity to do that on sites where, where it may not make economical sense. Uh, but and it also provides a, a, a foundation for for resources for the city to implement other um, uh, affordable housing strategies and some some jurisdictions are looking at affordable housing trust funds and using in lieu fees from their IHOs to to do that to purchase property do some land banking um, so um, I can't comment on the adequacy of, of how the fees are calibrated but um, but it's it's fairly common to have an in, in lieu fee option yeah well. and I know that's been an issue in, in cities like Pasadena where they were they were, the way they set their in lieu fee structure up is that it did provide sort of a disincentive to actually build the unit and, the, and they were just writing a check and so that's much easier and cheaper to do that. So we specifically, I remember when we went through that process, the council was making that point that we didn't want to set up a formula that incentivized developers not to build the units. We want the units built. That's the easiest way to get it done when a project's going through the process. Um, so, so definitely want to want to evaluate that because it's, it's a brand, brand new, um, uh, ordinance, obviously. So we're I, hopefully, hopefully it works out, but maybe we can, we can tweak it so that it, it works better. And, you know, maybe that hundred thousand dollars or that, at that amount, it is sufficient for, you know, to add on to one of the other projects that, um, that the city's doing. So maybe it does, maybe it, it, we can get some efficiencies there, but I agree, Eric, that's, that's not the way we want this set up. Well, I and to your point on the IHO, um, that'll be a component of a program that we recommend in the housing element would be ongoing monitoring of the IHO ordinance to ensure that it's not precluding development, to ensure the fees are the right size to monitor its performance. Um, so that's something we intend to recommend um, that the city does over the planning period. So. Great. Thank you, Chris. So we are past uh, seven. That was a fantastic discussion. Um, I appreciate it, Chris, and I appreciate everyone that's come. Um, uh, real quick, a um, few sentences. Just can you can you tell everyone here tonight how they can stay involved in this process? What 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 do you as a consultant need them to do, and, and what what should they be paying attention? To? Sure. So if you haven't already, um, you should sign up for updates. And so we have a project website. It's alhambrahousingelement.com. Um, the city links to it from uh, from its website. We link to the city's website from our website or from the project website, um, uh, on that uh, 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 website, you can review uh, past presentations. You can review, we have a, a memo on RENA. We have project documents we would be posted there. Um, uh, there, our schedule as it continues to update will be posted there. Uh, you can sign up for updates. So then when we have announcements and things, your email address can go in our database and we can get things sent out to you. Uh, so that's the first way to get involved. You can also su submit feedback in that way. So send, you know, there's an email address, send, send an email if you have a, a, a something you want to uh, to have reported as part of this process, please do. You can review our previous community workshop that we did, um, uh, as as was asked by by uh, by Lewis. Uh, we will be uh, having a document that is posted for public review as a part of this process, so this so the public will have a period of time to review the report in its entirety um, and then provide comment before it gets submitted to. HCD. After HCD gets its hands on it, then we'll go through adoption. So as the city goes through its formal adoption process, there'll be more opportunities for public comment through 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 that process. So we're sitting here on April fifteenth. Uh, this goes through October. So we have uh, uh, still a, a better runway in front of us here to uh, to get this. So October is our our sort of time frame that we're looking at to. Um... to yeah, roughly, roughly mid October for adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Well, that's that gives us some perspective. So hopefully, um, you know, maybe we can we can have some in person meetings too. Hopefully, knock on wood. Um, but if not, then then certainly this virtual capacity. And and I think we were talking before we went live that that um, the future looks like a hybrid public participation model. You know, you're you're going to have the opportunity to be in person at council meetings, commission meetings. You know public town halls, that kind of thing. But I think um, I'm, I'm certainly gonna be encouraging and pushing for 
uh, this virtual aspect to be incorporated into every meeting we do just because it's it's so much more feasible for so many more people to participate this way. Um, even if you have it on in the background, um, you hear us talking about all kinds of stuff and while you're cooking dinner and you want to chime in, that's great. So um, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there. We want a, a few minutes over, but um, um, if you have any more questions, I type my I change my uh, name there to my email address. So please feel free to email me directly. Write that down for any of your City of Alhambra purposes. Um, you can you can reach me there. So Chris, I just want to say thank you uh, for 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 doing these. I think you did five of these now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they put you through your paces. So thanks for providing this, you know, fantastic presentation. This is a really dense and complex um, topic, and it's not always clear. You know, the answers are not always clear, and you really helped to to sort of, I think, uh, bring some 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 clarity to the situation. And you know, we'll we'll continue to do these outreach efforts. And please, everyone, stay involved. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know your thoughts. Where we're, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So we'll leave it at that. Um, thanks to everyone for, for joining and thanks to Chris for, for providing us with this, with this informative um, hour and five minute um, talk. Excellent, thank you for having me. Thanks everyone.